Hello, and welcome to Cabinet Conversations. My name is Paul Tatro, and I'm the director of Ford's Theater. If you're joining us for the first time, this is the fourth event of our new series, Exploring Creativity, History, and Leadership. You can learn more and explore about past programs by visiting our website, Fords.org. During his presidency, Abraham Lincoln led the country through a whole series of overlapping crises. At Fords, we commemorate his legacy by, among many other things, sharing his legacy of leadership. Today, during this time of also overlapping crises, I'm pleased to introduce today's discussion on leadership in such times with Carly Fiorina and Sheila Johnson. Both of these women are among the most respected business leaders in the country. Sheila Johnson is an entrepreneur and philanthropist whose accomplishments span hospitality, sports, TV, film, the arts, education, women's empowerment, and community development. In 2016, she co-founded We Capital, a venture capital consortium to support female-led enterprises and empower the next generation of female entrepreneurs. She is founder and CEO of Salamander Hotels and Resorts and vice chairman of Monumental Sports and Entertainment. Carly Fiorina's experience spans public to private from nonprofit to for-profit and from secretary to the first woman to ever lead a Fortune 50 company as CEO. In her current role, she is founder and chair of Carly Fiorina Enterprises, a nonprofit organization that supports local leaders addressing issues in their communities and places of work, equipping them with tools to increase their leadership and problem solving capacity. Welcome, Carly and Sheila. Great Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, first, it's an extraordinary pleasure to have two people that I so thoroughly admire as leaders in our country, in business, in philanthropy, and who are both so committed to education and leadership. Today, we are here to talk about leadership. And some of those traits we particularly admire about Lincoln are courage, humility, empathy, collaboration, creativity. Could you talk about some of the important traits um, uh, that have led Lincoln through crisis, that lead us through crisis? Um, I know I've talked to both of you over the last several weeks, and we focused a little bit on empathy. I'd love for each of you to sort of talk a little bit about sort of some of those qualities of leadership that Lincoln possessed, and maybe with a little focus on empathy. Uh, Carly, do you want to go first? <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Paul, and it's great to be with you as well, Sheila. Uh, I feel blessed to be in such great company. So when I think about the characteristics of leadership that you just went through, courage, humility, empathy, collaboration, you know, you didn't once mention position or title. And I think one of the things that happens to us when times are good is we get really confused about leadership. And we think leadership is the person with a big title, the big office, a lot of power, maybe fame, maybe wealth. And then when the bad times come, we are reminded that leadership has nothing to do with those things. Yes, President Lincoln was the president of the United States, but he led effectively through successive crises because he brought to that position the characteristics that you mentioned, the courage to act, to see the truth, to speak the truth, and then act on the truth, the humility to understand he couldn't do it all alone, and so therefore he was willing actually to collaborate with others, many of whom didn't agree with him on a lot of things. And then to your point, empathy. I think empathy is so undervalued, and yet we need so much more of it. Empathy is the ability to value someone else's experience instead of judging someone because of it. It's to see someone and say, you know what, I want to know more about them, not in spite of their difference from me, but perhaps because of their difference from me. And Lincoln, of course, had to have enormous empathy. It's one of the reasons I think his presidency was such a heavy burden on him, because he had empathy for the suffering of so many, and yet he understood 
that some of that suffering was sadly necessary to achieve a larger and long overdue goal of emancipation. Right, right. Sheila, what do you think? Empathy, humility, I mean, Lincoln had these great qualities. Well, first of all, there's something that's been sitting in front of us for many, many years. And if you look at the penny, the face of Lincoln is right there on that penny. And he's always facing right. And why is that? Because in linear timeline, it means that he's forever facing forward and looking to the future. And that was one of the greatest things about Lincoln. He was always listening to the other guy and, and never made enemies. He kept his enemies very close. Um, he was an amazing man. And those people that disagreed with him, he even kept them closer. And I think that made him a very strong leader. Leadership is a little bit like courage. And um, it may be there all the time, but it's only when it's really needed that anyone notices. But on the same token, that's all also when they'll notice the lack of leadership. And leadership is really about rising to the occasion. And Lincoln always did that. And it's about calming fears, uniting and making people believe that they have it in themselves to rise above both individually and as collective. Whatever it is that is vexing them, they can go with business of living their lives as productive, productive members of society. And I think that's what was, was so important about Lincoln. Um, crises does build character and it's how you handle that crisis. It's almost impossible to talk about you know, great leaders because they always have to prove themselves. And when you, you know, there's male leaders and there's female leaders. And I think that we have to look at leadership differently as women. Um, we're always having to prove ourselves um, as a leader. And it's the way we, we handle our companies, it's the way we handle our, um, our friends, it's the way we, we run our companies. Um, and when you talk about empathy, I think empathy is really essential always. And when can it be detrimental? Almost never. It's really important. Um, I remember reading, um, I think it was a part in The Art of War by Sun, Sun Tzu. He talks about the critical nature of knowing one's enemy every bit as much as you know oneself. And that means learning to stand inside his or her shoes and training yourself to be able to see the world through a pair of eyes other than your own. And I think that's really important. And this is really the definition of empathy. And I thought that that was one of Lincoln's strongest, strongest qualities, that he was able to put himself in everybody's shoes and try to come out mm -hmm. to a solid recommendation of how he should move forward. Now, Sheila, you just gave me a whole list of things that I'm going to talk about for the next three hours, if we had three hours. But one of the things mm -hmm. I want to talk about is, and we touched on this a little bit yesterday, um, just in our prep meeting, it was the difference in leadership between men and women. Now, yes. you know, it is my great honor to be here with two strong women who I so much admire. But both of you have had to break through the glass ceiling. And I would love for each of you to talk a little bit about that. Um, Carly, I love telling the story that I recall from your first book, Tough Choices, about um, when you were in business and you were a rising um, manager. I believe it was at at and if I had it correct. And you were, I think, in Japan. And the guys were all going out to some gentleman's club. And you said, no, 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 I'll go along too. And how you sort of hung with the guys and really it was one of the lessons that you took away on how you had to sort of work extra hard. How both of you, I know, had to work extra hard to break into leadership and break through the glass ceiling. Tell us a little about that and give some insight to our listeners, Carly. You know, uh there's an expression, not an expression, there's a reality called white privilege. And we talk a lot about it with regard, obviously, to race relations. But I think 
it also impacts this question you're talking about. White men are generally presumed to be competent and to deserve the job they're in. That's just a fact. If you're a white man, generally people look at you and they say, oh, you've earned that job, you're competent for that job, you deserve that job. If you are a woman or a person of color, that presumption does not exist. And that's what she mm -hmm. means when she says, we have to prove it. If you're different, it's different. And so proving it means that you have to demonstrate day in and day out, I can do this job, I've earned this job, and therefore I can earn your respect. I think Sheila made a, another really important point. She said, you know, character is how we choose to face those challenges. And I think that's so true. There's a saying, you know, tough times build character. I actually think tough times reveal character. And what I've learned, and I know from uh, knowing Sheila and knowing much about her incredible accomplishments, I know that leaders are clear-eyed about the situation and the circumstances they find themselves in. They choose their times to confront the circumstances that they are in, but they also never sell their souls or diminish their own character by uh, how they confront or how they demonstrate their competence. They instead bolster their character and earn people's respect. And all the way back to Lincoln, I mean, Lincoln had for different reasons, Lincoln had a whole host of detractors, bitter retractors. Mm -hmm. One of the things I say all the time is criticism mm -hmm. is the price of leadership. It's the price. Every leader, particularly one who's different, whether they're a woman or a person of color, particularly one who has to prove it every day, but every leader has to be able to deal with criticism because it is the price. It goes with the territory. And how a leader responds to criticism says a lot about who they are and how strong a leader they can be. So I want to layer something else on top of this that we as women deal with on a daily basis. And I know I do not just as an African-American woman who owns a company and runs a company, but I have a lot of males that work for me. And Carly, and I bet you this has happened to you. Have you ever been in a meeting and you're giving out all of these incredible um, ideas <laughs> and then the men around the room, they're just ignoring you. If I could write a one act play. <laughs> I know I, what I, you're I gonna say. That, <laughs> you know, and then they turn around and they say exactly the same thing that you've already talked about and they're getting credit for it. And I'm gonna tell you another little piece of history. Did you know that the, the um, oh, what are they? The uh, rape kits. Do you know that was designed and invented by a woman? But it was a man, it was a Chicago police sergeant, a male who branded it in his own name. And to this day, it still carries his name, but it was a woman who invented this rape kit. Right. But we see examples of this all the time. And it, it is just truly amazing. And I sit back and I look at corporate boards and I'm looking at the men that get on these corporate boards and women can't get on, especially African-American women. And I'm like, how in the world? But it's such a close knit um, fraternity of men and they just grease each other's hands. OK, I'll put you on that board if you put me on that board. And I've seen this happen. And these are things that women have to deal with. We deal with this all the time. Yeah. And, you know, Sheila, to your point about boards, and I've said precisely the same thing publicly many times, you know, here's the, here's the truth. People are most comfortable with people like themselves. People are most yes. comfortable with people like themselves. That's why the ability yes. to collaborate with people that are different than themselves is such an important and distinguishing characteristic of true leaders. But because people are most comfortable with people like themselves, the consequence of that is that whoever's at the table tends to stay at the right. table and tends to bring more of their own to the table. And until we realize, until we realize that having 
different people around the table yields better results. And the data is clear. Absolutely. It does. The data is clear. It does. A diverse team delivers better results, period. Yeah. Until and I mean, it makes your company. That. Yeah. Until we really yeah. understand that, then the status quo is powerful because I'm more comfortable being with people like me. So I'm going to bring more people like me that yeah. I already know to the table. And that's what's going on in this country right now. We do not have a diversity in thought and we don't have a diversity in ideas. And we don't, you know, we talk about diversity as far as race, cultural and gender, but we have got to bring more voices to the table. And this is people of color, people from different cultures, um, men and gender. Yes. And that's the only way that we're going to become stronger as far as in the business sense, but also in this country. And we're being very, very short-sighted about that. And that is what's going on right now. And this is the frustration that we're feeling. Yes. And and to the point, you, all you, back to the beginning, Paul, you know, um, humility and empathy are critical to collaboration. And when you bring all those different voices to the table, Sheila, Unless people can right. collaborate effectively with one another, you just argue. You don't come up with better ideas. And that's where humility and empathy come in. Because humility says, you know what? I don't know it all. And I've missed a right. lot of things. And empathy says, you know, I don't really understand what that person is saying. But boy, do I want to understand them and what they're saying better. Instead right. of saying, gee, I don't get it. I judge them as not worthy of my time and attention. And we do too much of that. Exactly. Too. And we hear a lot of that. And this also goes back to leadership and it's like a relationship. And if you're good at relationships, there's a good chance that you can be a very strong leader. And because you're good at relationships, if you can communicate openly and free, you listen to people and you're not afraid to apologize. You learn to celebrate the successes of others and have raw materials, you're a great leader. Okay, you've just hit on something, Sheila, that I wanna jump on. You talked about the ability to apologize. I've always yeah. said, and I know I've talked to both of you over the years about this, that I think one of the great strengths of a true leader is the ability to be wrong and admit it, and, and, and admit it in front of their their peers, their subordinates, whoever, that you can be wrong because I think, once again, that shows humility. Talk a little bit about that, the ability to, to not be afraid to be wrong, to make mistakes, and to, to learn from that. Sheila. Well, you know, uh, for many years, I was, I was a school teacher, <laughs> and I've been around a lot of young people. I'm a grandmother now. Um, just because I'm an adult, later in life, I have to say that I still make mistakes. And one thing that I've learned in my life, I will even stand up in front of my um, own kids and say, look, you know what, you're right. I learn from you every day. There's nothing wrong with that. And I try to teach these lessons of humility. And I want them to know that I, I'm I'm vulnerable. I make mistakes and I do it even within my company. If I, I'm listening to something or listening to ideas, I present an idea. And if they come out, I said, you know what? I like your idea better. I'm willing to listen to it. Let's give it a try. I gain more respect that way rather than just saying, well, I'm not going to listen to you. It's either my way or the highway. It's just it's not going to work. And I think there's just too many people out there that just don't understand that you've got to listen to be able to learn from one another. And that's, that's really the beauty in it. You know, my company is called Salamander and they ask why Salamander? Well, at a time in my life, I was walking through a very difficult situation and the Salamander, when I decided to choose that name from a, a World War II fighter pilot who was shot down over Nazi Germany. He was given the code name Salamander to go back to rescue his unit out of a POW camp. And I said, well, what does the Salamander stand for? And Bruce Sunland said, you know, mythically it's the only animal that can walk through fire and still come out alive. He said, but if you chop off its limbs, they grow back. And I've learned a lot from that symbol. And, um, 
every Monday, uh, I walk, the employees walk through a recitation of what the salamanders means. And it stands for courage, fortitude, perseverance, and resilience. And I think these are the qualities that I try to live by. And I try to teach my children. And I've learned from everyone else that this is the way we have got to live. We've got to be resilient and being able to learn to be open and listening to other people. Wow. You know, Sheila, it's so powerful what you just said and so true. And um, I want to translate it into a, into a corporate setting for a moment because there may be people who are saying, yeah, well, okay, that's great, but, you know, Sheila's this ex extraordinarily successful person and she owns this big company and, okay, so she can admit, admit a mistake, but I can't admit a mistake. Right. Here's what I've learned over and over in business in difficult times, but particularly in crisis. An imperfect decision made in a timely fashion is always better than a perfect decision made too late. Right. So if that's true, and it is true, an imperfect decision made in a timely fashion is always better than a perfect decision made too late. Then the second you say that and realize it, then the minute you also realize we're not going to get it all right. We're going to make right. mistakes. We're going to have to take some risks. Mm -hmm. And so risk taking and mistake making are critical to innovation. They are critical to timely decision making. They're critical to progress. And so when people say, I never make a mistake, I immediately think, wow, how much time did you waste trying to get something perfect? Right. I also think, wow, what arrogance you must have because we all make exactly. mistakes. But I also know that mistake making is vital to risk taking, to innovation, to timely decision making. So if we can't ever admit a mistake, then we're not ever going to be willing to make a mistake, and then we're not going to do what we got to do in a timely fashion. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's the only way you can grow. Personally. As a or a person. Yes, right. absolutely. So I, t I say to the Ford's Theater staff all the time, let's make new mistakes. Yes. So that's how we know we're growing, right? Let's not, I don't need you to make the mistakes we made yesterday. Let's go out and make new mistakes. I mean, you, Carly, you've been worked for a major tech company. What is R and D but making new mistakes and figuring out things and changing and growing? That's right. So mistakes are critical. Yeah, make the, um, make one mistake one time, learn from it, move on. <laughs> move on, exactly. Um, Sheila, you talked about team of rivals, which of course, as we all know, Lincoln was you know the master of sort of surrounding himself with people that thought differently than him, that brought different perspectives to it. Both of you have led, you know, sort of major companies and lead a major company, and you've had many lieutenants and people around you. How do you um, embrace that sort of team arrivals and, and surrounding yourself with people with uh, sort of diversity of thought and ideas as Lincoln did so successfully? Well, I think what people have to understand, even in starting a company, yes, I've hired the wrong people. And you have to make sure the people that you bring into your company and who are really going to be your thought provokers or the people that are going to help you grow the company, you've got to make sure that they are uh, sharing your vision, that they don't come in with their own agenda. Because many times if they come in with their own agenda, they're not going to be on the same wavelength of you. And um, it's surprisingly enough, and I call them energetic vampires. There have been people that I have brought in and they see success and they just ride on your coattails. And you don't want yes men. You want people that are ethical, that um, have good moral standards, um, good character. Uh, because that's what's going to also help me become a great leader because I want to feed off of them. And that's what's really important. And I, I'd say I have made mistakes in hiring. Believe me, I have. And I've learned from those mistakes. 
But you have to understand the team that you put together is the only way you're going to be successful. That team is so important. You want to have the strongest team that respects one another, that can communicate, that can um, really, even if they disagree, that we come to a consensus of thought of how we move forward. Uh, you just don't want them to keep putting roadblocks in because if they do, then something else is going on. And um, it, it, it's really been amazing, even in trying to start this hospitality company, being one of the very few women, and there's nothing but men, um, I have really had to really strong arm and take up for myself in, in different areas to make sure that my voice is being heard and that I'm respected. And whoever you bring around in your orbit you have to make sure that they have a real understanding of the journey in which you want to build your company. And that's what I've had to do. You know, Paul, I think one of, in addition to all the wisdom Sheila just shared, um, I would add just a couple things. Number one, I think as a leader, we have to get, we have to be very good at asking questions. Sometimes mm -hmm. leaders in a position of authority feel like their job is to deliver all the answers. And in fact, the most important job a leader sometimes has is to ask questions and then listen to the answers. A leader has to create an environment where the truth is told and where differences of opinion really show up at the table so that they can be discussed and ultimately, to Sheila's point, resolved towards a common purpose and a goal that everyone agrees upon. But the ability to ask questions, to create an environment in which truth is up on the table, in which people, you know, you've known people who go into a room and say, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. You go, girl, it's great. And then they go outside the room and they say, oh my God, that's never gonna work. What a horrible idea. A leader has to create a culture and environment where everything gets said on the table and to someone's face. That's right. how you build a team where people can respect one another, disagree with one another when necessary, and ultimately collaborate with one another and get a decision made so that they can move on. And you know, when you, Paul, you're the, the great Lincoln historian among us, but when you um, read about the kinds of meetings and discussions that President Lincoln had with his team of rivals. What you see is somebody who listened as much as he talked. You see someone who asked questions. You see someone who sought the truth, even when that truth was kind of unpleasant and uncomfortable. And those are all things that great leaders do. It's almost like, you know, as you said, um, Sheila and, and Carly, both of you on this point is that you want you want the, the diff, dis, not dissension, but you want to hear what those differing points of view are in the room. As I always like to Absolutely. say, please, you know, I don't want a yes person around. I want people to come in to challenge the position of the institution, the organization, the company, and let us get it out there, hash it. Let's throw all the ideas on the table and then figure out what our collective position is when we walk out of this room and let's all be on board. You know, that's the key. I think, yeah, I was gonna say, I think Carly, what could be different between the two of us when I entered my third act in life, coming out of the entertainment business, you know, I just decided to start a hospitality company. I knew nothing about it. But what I wanted to do was to assemble the best and the brightest minds that could teach me something about how to start this company. And I humbly did it. You know, I brought in some of the best people that were recommended. Some of them were not right. Um, and I learned from them. But to be able to build a team that I could sit and listen to and I could ask all those questions, those difficult questions. And I have learned so much over the past 15 years of just building a company and what we've been through, um, even having to deal with community and racial issues and trying to get a resort built. I mean, 
it's it's a whole different ball game because I had so many things that I had to deal with. And you're absolutely right to be able to bring the people in the room and ask those crucial questions and which you can learn from. Because I don't want people who are listening to this to think, oh, she just came out of nowhere and she started a hospitality company. You guys have no idea what I've been through and all of the things that I had to do to learn from so many of the experts. And they're still with me. I've only fired two people but the rest of them around and we keep building this incredible team of people that um, I'm learning from every single day and I will give them credit. I said, you know, I had no idea that's what we had to do. And it's right. just been an amazing journey. Right. Well, you mentioned something there, Sheila, that I also think is a great trait um, of good leadership is giving credit. You know, I've often, uh, too often, I've worked with people that are sort of arrogant, think they know it all, really think they're the smartest person in the company. And I said to those people, I said, first of all, by surrounding yourself with great people, you actually become a better leader. And I think that's one of the things that great leaders do. They give credit away and they're not afraid to like bring on other great people and listen to them and talk to them. I mean, Carly, when you were building companies and building, you know, and working with, um, you know, just sort of giant, giant corporations, I presume that that's something you had to do, that you had to sort of share credit, give credit away. Well, I think you're, you're hitting on something very fundamental about leadership that we also can frequently forget. Leaders serve others. Leaders serve a purpose bigger than themselves. Maybe that purpose is to build a new company, as Sheila experienced. Uh, maybe that purpose is to unify a nation. Maybe that purpose is to achieve a goal that has so far escaped the company. But the point is, a leader serves a purpose larger than themselves. A leader doesn't say, this is all about me. This is all about my position. This is all about my power. This is all about credit to me. No. The leader, in a very real sense, is subordinate to the purpose. And so once you decide that, that as a leader you serve, then it's not about credit to yourself. It's about achievement of the goal, whatever that is, building a great hotel, unifying a nation, as Lincoln did, and achieving emancipation, achieving any objective in this set of crises you know, I see so many leaders who become paralyzed because they think they're supposed to know it all, do it all, get it all right. No, <laughs> you're not going to know it all, do it all by yourself and get it all right. But what you can do is serve a purpose and serve with others to achieve that purpose. And once you do that, it's freeing because you don't have to take credit and you don't have to be right all the time, but you do need to make progress towards your goal. I think one of the greatest things that um, gives me such pleasure is whenever I'm opening a new hotel and I have my team around me and I will openly acknowledge, I said, you know, this is my company, I'm founder and CEO, but there's a team of people here that I could not have done it alone. And it's so true. You cannot do anything alone. You have to do it with a great team of people. And I have no problems acknowledging all of the people around me that make me look good. And that's what's so important. Well, listen, this is, this is a fantastic conversation, but we've got a lot of people out there listening to us and we've started to get some questions in. So I'd like to encourage our listeners to keep sending their questions in and I'm going to throw a couple at the two, um, at Sheila and Carl. So we talked about making mistakes and the importance of being able to own up to those. So one of our listeners asked, do you feel that it is different as a woman, a female leader, a female CEO, to admit mistakes and that you have to, it's, it's more challenging and your approach is different than say a male CEO or a, a, a male a leader owning up to mistakes. What do you think of that? 
which one of us should go for? Well, want me to go? Would, Sheila, go ahead, grab at it. <laughs> well, first of all, I have not been, I've been in very few situations where men apologize for their mistakes. <laughs> they will cover up or they will gaslight you or, you know, figure out a way to weasel out. They don't like to be criticized. And that's something that I've learned. I also run into a lot of narcissism uh, among men, male leadership, a lot. Um, I have to say um, myself personally, I don't know, maybe it's just something about me. I will apologize and I will say, you know, um, you know, I made a mistake here. I feel comfortable within my own self and my own leadership. And it could be because I own the company, I founded the company, and I will say, and I don't think that it diminishes me in any way to be able to admit a mistake or to apologize. Um, I can't speak a lot for other women and how they feel in a different situation. I can only speak in my situation. And even during the, the BET days, um, there were times when I just was able to just see where the problems were and I would reach out and try and help solve them. And there were a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course that's what leaders do. They solve problems. Yeah. <laughs> that's a purpose bigger than themselves. But um, to just add on to what Sheila said, first of all, it's different when you're different. Okay. It's different. Yeah. When you're different. So yes, it's different. The thing that I think um, is also true is people are pretty shrewd observers. So if a leader has made a mistake, whether it's a man or a woman, people know it. People know it. <laughs> uh, I think the vital thing when you're admitting a mistake is to go beyond the I made a mistake here, I'm sorry. And to begin to put forward, what are we gonna do about it? So that people don't feel like, oh my gosh, this is a crushing defeat, or this is an admission of helplessness, or we don't know what we're supposed to do next. No, not at all. So I think the context in which a mistake is admitted is very important. We made a mistake or I made a mistake here. Here's what I've learned from that mistake. Here's how we've gotten stronger and better because of this mistake. Here's how we're not going to make that mistake again. And here's how we're going to continue to make progress. I think um, all of that is important. If there is a leader, man or woman, who has made a series of mistakes and who is continuing to pursue a path that isn't working, everybody knows it. And that leader is diminished over time by their unwillingness or inability to course correct. They're not lifted up by that. They are diminished over time. And you're, yeah, you're right. I think that, people, go ahead, Sheila. I was going to say, I think people have to understand it's not just about you or me. It's about us collectively. And how are we going to move forward to build a stronger country of a stronger business corporation but we're all in it together as we keep hearing that phrase right now right well and i think you're absolutely right i mean both of what, what you both said is you know you're not fooling anyone when you make these mistakes right. it's like people know it and then the real question is you know the, the whether it's employees or whether followers they're sort of like how long is it going to take them to acknowledge it because we all know it right so yeah. the question is Okay, we got another question, and we because I've got you know got such a great uh, panel here. Uh, a question has come in: What guidance do you have on on how we might talk to girls or young women about how they can and should become leaders, and what is the most important thing for them to know about becoming leaders? What would you say to young women um, today, Carly? I would start by saying that the fundamental qualities of leadership, courage, character, humility, empathy, collaboration, seeing possibilities, serving a purpose larger than themselves, those are characteristics that are available to every single one of us as human beings, boys and girls, men and women. 
So each of us have the capacity for leadership. I know that, I've seen it, I've experienced it. So every young girl, every young boy as well, but every young girl has the capacity for leadership. Yes, we must acknowledge not everyone has the circumstances that allow them to take advantage of the opportunities that their own potential provide for them. And that is why we have a long overdue conversation in this country coming about reckoning and um, making sure that we have equal opportunity for all and that we continue Lincoln's legacy. However, having said that, I would also say to young girls that it's important that they understand they have that capacity and it's important that they go to people who will lift them up because there are people who will tear them down. That's true for all of us. But all of us encounter people who want to tear us down, put us down, diminish us, dismiss us, disrespect and disregard us. And all of us also can go to people who will lift us up and who will see our potential and help us unlock our potential. So spend your time with the people who lift you up, not the people who tear you down. That sounds so simple. Yeah. It turns out it's hard to do sometimes for people because their tribe, while they think a tribe is giving them support, in many cases, unfortunately, a tribe may be holding them back. Right. You know, I echo everything that Carly has said. Um, as an African-American woman, I have seen so many different circumstances, especially with young African-American women. And the thing that I wanna throw out there to my listeners, there are difficulties in our culture where I have told, and I've put some students through the Kennedy School at Harvard, um, I've paid their way, and the thing that I'm constantly telling them is to make sure they watch who they bring into their environment. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's very scary if you're not careful, and I'm trying to teach them about intuition and to really um, be careful. Everything that Carly said is really important, and I've tried to be that mentor to so many young girls who are there, but they have also got to take on the responsibility of being very careful whom they choose to bring into their life. Because just like Carly said, they will try and tear you down. There is just something about human nature out there that once you start becoming successful, there's jealousy, there's ways in which they're gonna put roadblocks um, and with, especially with African-American women, there are just, it's the society. They do not want to see us move forward. And I'm just saying that just be very, very careful on who you bring around you and to make sure that you have the best people that can continue to push you forward, that can lift you up and that can listen to you and make sure that you continue to be on the right path. And that goes for both men and women and it, it's it's really important right that's great well, let me ask you because we've been talking sort of around sort of the the various crises that we're in now we know we have this sort of like you know health pandemic and health crisis sort of surging in various waves up and down around the country but we also have this social unrest that's happening right now and, you know, sort of that really sort of what I say sort of restarted with the murder of George Floyd and other young African-Americans around the country and the sort of social unrest that we have. What are some of the leaders that we have in our country now that you find are really speaking to sort of that unrest in our country and are, are, are bringing some clarity to those issues? And... Um, and could you talk a little about folks that you see out there in our country, whether it's business leaders or whether it's political leaders, but people that are sort of speaking to the ache and the yearning that is happening in our country right now with sort of the social unrest? Well, I, I just want to say that there, 
I am very impressed by the young people out there. You know, as a uh, president and managing partner of my Washington Mystics, our national championships, my players have really stepped forward yes. to really take on a leadership role. I really feel as though at my age, and, and there's a lot of great older leaders out there, I think it's kind of time, it's time for them to step aside and listen and just su uh, supply the support. I think we're in a new era now. And we've got so many hungry young people that really want to make a difference. Um, the 50 students that I have put through the Center for Public Leadership from Harvard are just amazing. They're out there on the front lines. They're in the communities on the health care issues. I've got one in the Supreme Court that is um, clerking for um, uh, so, 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 OK, I'm getting all tongue twisted. <laughs> You know who I'm talking about. That's just I, I just, yes, right. And so they're out there on the front lines. And one thing that I've learned from them, it is time for me to step aside. The, the jargon has changed. The ideas are changing uh, on how we need to, to have new voices out there. And it's time we have new voices. I think we've had some great leaders in the past. It's time for them now to step aside, but we should be there just to be able to provide support and that safety net for them. But I think it's time for them to grow. We're aging out and they see things a lot differently. And what is going on in this country has, had, has been going on for a long time and it's time that it's needed to be addressed. I mean, just in what I've gone through and trying to build a resort out here in Middleburg, um, I've gone through the same racial issues. They have been horrific. They're scary. It has not gone away. And if people think it's gone away, they're crazy. But it's really has raised its ugly head. And because of technology and cell phones, um, we're seeing it now. We're really seeing it. And people are experiencing the diversity of leadership, I think is really important. It just shouldn't be African Amer young African American leaders. It should be also white uh, leaders, young leaders that can work where they can work together. I think we need to show this nation that all cultures can start working together. And as I said before, diversity of thought and ideas to be able to problem solve. But I really think that's where this leadership is now starting to surface. Right. So let me just build on that because I think um, there's so much truth in everything that Sheila just said. You, you know, one of the things that I've learned over and over again is that uh, problems are best solved by people who understand them best, people who are closest to them. And what that means, I think, is that the leadership necessary to solve so many of these systemic problems is going to have to come from people, to Sheila's point, who understand the problem. So what is the problem? The problem is systemic racism and structural inequity that has existed in this country for decades and centuries. And we talked about leaders being people who see the truth, speak the truth, and act on the truth. And I think what you're seeing is more and more people, regardless of whether they have a position of leadership or a title of leadership or not, more and more people being willing to stand up wherever they are, in whatever community they're in, and see the truth and speak the truth and act on the truth and say, among other things, it's time for a change. The pandemic, of course, is terrible in so many ways. But in another way, it, I think if we are thoughtful about it, I think it has been a great gift. And I use that term very advisedly, but you know, all leaders understand that in crisis, there is an opportunity. What is the gift of the, what is the lesson we have learned from this pandemic? I think there are two lessons. The first lesson we've learned is we are all connected. We are all connected. And so it turns out that the structural inequities and the systemic racism that prevents people from having 
a access to quality health care and quality food is impacting all of us now. And suddenly that's up on the table mm -hmm. and on the front burner for everyone to see. We're all connected. The second thing it's taught us is that the simplest choice can actually change things. Do I wear a mask or not can change things. Do I stay home or not can change things. That Those lessons are incredibly valuable if we will heed them. <clears throat> We are all connected. Out of sight cannot be out of mind. Structural inequities and systemic racism damage us all. People closest to the problem know best how to solve it. So let's listen to the people who understand this problem because they have lived it. And it turns out that each one of us can make choices that can help make this better. And the first choice each of us can make is to see the truth and speak the truth and act on the truth. Whether everybody agrees with us or not, whether our tribe gets upset with us or not, seeing the truth, speaking the truth, and acting on the truth always takes courage, but it also is always required for progress to be made. And I think it's coming all the way back down to leadership, too. We need yeah. leaders in this country that are going to be examples on how we move forward. Exactly. Absolutely. What an amazing place to sort of bring us to a close here. Um, we started with sort of like the idea that crisis brings out great leaders um, and also sort of bringing it back to, you know, we need young leaders to step forward now and to really lead us during this time. I, I think the, the hope for, I think, the three of us is that I believe that young people are going to lead us into a really positive direction in this country. And I think that's where there's the great hope and optimism. And I think Lincoln would feel terrific about that as well, that the young people are going to lead us into hope and optimism, and they're going to show great leadership. I want to thank so very much uh, Sheila Johnson and Carly Fiorino for joining us for today's Cabinet Conversation. And thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, we'll continue to respond to your comments and questions that we didn't get to in the live session today. If you like today's cabinet conversation, please consider making, making a gift to Ford's Theater uh, and just go to Ford's.org uh, slash donate. Uh, and please join us for our next conversation on July 30th. Again, Sheila, Carly, thank you so very much. Um, what a true welcome. pleasure and a great thank way to spend so. an afternoon. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very Bye -bye. much for joining. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.